Um, so my youngest is um, really struggling with missing his friends. He did, uh, he really enjoyed school um, as far as maybe not so much the education part, but the socialization part. He loved his teachers. It was something that he really looked forward to every day. And so he's not allowed to do that anymore. He can't do that. Um, and that's been really a big struggle for him. We've tried to find ways to get, make that easier on him with things like Zoom and Kid Messenger. And, um, but there's only so much you can do. There's no recess, there's no playing sports with your friends. Um, my other son, um, he's a little older and every day has, he wants to hear the news of what's going on in the world. And he's, uh, I don't know, not obsessing over it, but way more concerned about what's happening. You know, who, you know, why can't we find out more? Why don't we know more? Why, you know, lots of why questions that I can't answer. So that's been a big challenge for him because I think there's so much confusion over, um, and, you know, his, some of his friends have said they're, they're worried about it, about it, about, catching it. Uh, some of his friends are not. Um, uh, people in public, if you walk around, you'll see some people will try to stay away from you and some won't. Um, and so he's like, I don't get it. I can't explain it. And I, and I can't. <laughs> so, I, you know, I feel like as a mom, I wish I could do a better job of that, but I don't know what to say. And you know what, before you jump in there, Dr. Upshaw, if everybody will just make sure that they are muted when they're not speaking, I think it just helps maybe with some of the echoing a little bit. So I'll, I'm going to mute here in a second um, and let you kind of just respond to that for us, Dr. Upshaw. So it sounds like in a nutshell, almost that Shelly was saying, you know, her one son seems to be worried more and has a lot more questions. And then the other son is maybe down a little bit more about that lack of socialization and, and how do you respond to that? Yeah, so Shelly, um, you said that your two boys, I think you said one was in fifth grade and one was, was seven years old, is that right? Oh, no, one is in fifth and one is in seventh grade. So, one so one's 13, and one was 13. Yeah. I gotcha, okay. Yeah, and so in general, what we would expect is that the younger kids kind of up until that fourth or fifth grade range probably are struggling a little bit more with this in terms of not being able to see their friends and then I'm not sure how much you know your two boys are on technology um, but I know that that age range of about sixth grade till about 14 15 years old they seem to be doing the best with this because um, they have some communication with their friends, and in general, this is a whole new world we're living in with technology, but in general, um, especially boys and, and even girls to some extent tend to communicate a lot online in that age range, and they don't get together in person quite as much, and then we see a big shift when the kids get a little older, that shifting back out of technology and wanting to get together with their friends a little bit more. So we would expect that fifth grade through early high school kind of probably be navigating this the best in terms of feeling connected to their friends because being home and communicating online is kind of a normal part of that of that age range. And so your younger son might be struggling with that a little bit more because he's used to seeing his friends a little bit more. Also, of course, everyone's personality, your kid's personality is different too. And I've seen that a lot in our practice. We see a lot of kids, a lot of adolescents, and it really just depends on kind of the temperament of the kid, their relationship with friends, the relationship with their parents. And um, I would say to the anxiety part, because that's kind of what I would call it, a little bit of anxiety about what's happening, you know, what should we do? Um, problem is the parents don't even really know what this is all about. And when they talk about the pandemic, we're talking about two different things. Number one, the actual medical problem, um, which we need to solve. But then there's also the social crisis of the uncertainty of how all of this is going to end. And we're still kind of in that. So what they're hoping is at some point we get to a part where this shifts and we kind of understand how this is gonna look and where this is gonna go. And then we still have to deal with the medical side, but there's still so much uncertainty. And I see that in my practice. Everyone is just kind of a little bit more on edge. They don't even really associate it with the pandemic per se but that's what I'm picking up on. Everyone's a little bit on it. So 
I wouldn't beat yourself up too much about how to explain it because we don't even really know how to explain it to ourselves that well. Do you have um, just one follow-up, Dr. Upshaw, because I think what Shelly said a lot, this comes up all the time. How do we, when we don't have the answers as adults, what, is, what are maybe some key things that we can say to our kids? And I know it probably depends a lot on age as well and, and personality, but do you have any, um, off the top of your head, any advice for how do we give our kids some answers? Yeah, so the first thing is to try to explore a little bit with your son to see what are his concerns. Is he concerned that he's going to get sick? Is he concerned that someone in the family is going to get sick? Is he concerned that he wants to go see his friends and he can't? Because you don't want to kind of go into too much detail if you don't have to, and you want to kind of address the specific concern you may have. In general, what we tell kids is that luckily they're very low risk to get this, and if they do get this, it's very unlikely that they're going to get super sick. So that's one thing you want to reassure them that, that they're going to be okay. Um, the next thing is you want to let them know that, the, that you and the family have a plan and that you guys feel confident in things. So listen, you know, this is our plan. This is what we're going to do for right now. We're going to do these things, but we're not going to go do these things. And then in a few weeks, you know, we're going to reassess because really, to be honest, as adults, people are on a very wide range of what they're comfortable with and what they're worried about versus kind of what they're what they're doing so just just as you as a family kind of understand where you're at and then kind of reassure them that this is this is what we're doing and then when we get more information this is what it's going to look like thank you oh, I didn't. Um, oh sorry i was just going to say it's interesting that you say that because i've seen with um noah specifically he takes other people's actions around him very personally so if someone tries to maintain six feet he will feel like he, he'll ask me, he'll say, did I do something wrong? Do they think I have it? Do I look sick? And I'm like, no, no. People are just doing what they need to do and what they feel comfortable with. And he's like, okay, okay. But, and, but I feel like he doesn't fully believe me because I'm just but, a mom. So. But here's the other thing. You're, you're correct about that. But if you'll notice as an adult when you're out, people are behaving in very different ways. Some people are wearing masks, some people are not. Some people are concerned about the distance, some people are not. So the kids pick up on this pattern that things are not operating like normal. And you know, there's a certain normalcy to how social interactions go. And all of that's really off now. And so if you have a, a kid who's super sensitive to that, they're gonna pick up on it and it's gonna make them anxious and they're gonna wanna understand it. Thank you. Hey, Rob, I'm going to have you jump in here. Obviously, you have a unique situation. Um, your daughter, Elle, seven years old, living with special needs, as you said, Down syndrome. Um, share with me some of your struggles lately. Okay, well, um, we are neighbors with uh, Shelly and Chris and Luke and Noah, and Elle just adores the boys. We live in a condo, so um, one of the biggest struggles we have living in a condo environment is the closeness, right? and our green space is limited. So one of the, well, one of the biggest things that L has really had problems with is the pool is like her environment. That's like kind of her reward, right? So when she does well with her studies or at school, then that's one of the carrots we hang over her head and then you can go swimming. Well, they close the pool and so like when we're trying to give her some exercise, you know, for a seven year old and get some of that energy out, we'd go down to the tennis court, she'd walk past the pool and she'd say, swim, swim daddy. And I'm like, oh, we can't swim. Well, you know, we're on the opposite spectrum, uh, try cognitively trying to explain to Elle why the pool that's perfectly good right there, she can't go into. And um, that's been a, a challenge. Um, not seeing people in there is the only way we can kind of like show her that, yeah, we're not allowed to use the pool right now, Elle. But she doesn't understand, you know, why and the aspects of it. And, you know, with L and being Down syndrome, she emulates, you know, school was so good for her because she's the only non-typical child in the classroom. And so 
she models after her peers and we love that but her not being able to go to school and do that modeling has been really difficult we've been doing the zoom with her three times a week with her kindergarten class and initially it was a struggle and she's really picked it up really well and uh, she also has private therapy and uh, therapy through the school system with OT. And so she does that three times a week as well. So she is bombarded with, you know, this online learning. The problem with Elle is she is, um, you know, you have to demonstrate everything. And uh, that's where it's been the hardest problem or the most difficult in uh, dealing with this. I'll let you jump in there, Dr. Upshaw. I know that, you know, that's a lot, but just kind of absorbing some of that, what, what comes to mind for you? Yeah, so I, I see obviously a, a, just a ton of special needs kids and adolescents in my practice. And big thing I, I always talk to families about is it's all about um, what's the environment at home? What can the person do to get out to have a meaningful life and develop and progress? And the last thing we always think about is medications, right? So, you know, for you guys, the home environment hasn't changed too much. You know, you're kind of stuck at home. You can't use the pool. That's tough to explain. But really what's changed is the routine for L outside of the house. And so, you know, it's all about routine. It's all about having things set up in a way where, you know, we've got everything tweaked. Okay, this is the process. This is how things go. This seems to be working great. Let's go with that. And now everything is changed. And so that is very, very difficult for anyone, but especially for someone who's got special needs, that's the whole point. You know, it's a very difficult thing to kind of ad adapt to. And so I would expect that would be pretty tough. Yeah, we've, we've uh, you know, cognitively, we've seen a regression in her learning, but we have, like you said, we've molded this environment to her school environment. First thing in the morning, she gets up and she starts doing her schoolwork whether that's, you know, working on her letters, her counting, what have you. And then at nine o'clock, she rolls right into her kindergarten class. And then at 12 o'clock, she has an OT therapy. And then at three, she has another one. So she does that Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And then between, we supplement. But, you know, the whole, um, you know, the reward thing is, is really hard. We just have been able to open our pool to a limited availability where we sign up two units per hour. And that's been a blessing for her. She's really taken off, but she, when this first started, she is super stressed. Like all, all the kids have been right. But, uh, her not trying, you know, us trying to explain what's going on has been the hardest part, you know, where on the other dynamic, you've got uh, Luke that's concerned about the news, watching it all the time and, and asking questions. We don't have that. We just have a child that's disrupted and she doesn't understand why. Hey, yeah, Rob, I, just, I wanna, uh, or, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Upshaw. No, I just wanted to, to, to just reinforce everything you said, that's that's just right on, and it sounds like you guys are just dealing with it the, the best that you can. Yep. You know, before I move on to Alicia, Rob, I wanna ask you, um, you know, we're I think as parents, we're obviously putting our kids first all the time. That is our primary worry. I know nothing about this disease or this virus keeps me up at night beyond thinking about my kids potentially getting it. So I think we can all agree to that. That is our biggest anxiety as parents. But for yourself, do you wanna kind of maybe jump a couple ideas off Dr. Upshaw in terms of, have you had your own stress or your own mental health, anything like that, that it, it then kind of, it's not just L stress, but then it trickles onto you and you're bearing that weight, anything like that? Because I know Dr. Upshaw, you see so many clients of all ages. Oh, abs absolutely. We, uh, so we all feel the stress in this, uh, new norm, as they say. Um, and Nikki and I have scheduled our time to get our mental health, you know, stress, uh, 
you know, reducers. And that's whether I go, you know, out for a bike ride, whether I take L with me or not. Um, you know, now that they open the beaches, I'm gonna get to go kiteboarding, but you know, she'll do her walks, I'll do mine. We schedule our mental health around L's as well, you know. She's got to do her studies, but we also have to give her her time to get out there and enjoy the the environment, the fresh air, the sunlight. It's so so important. Um, you know, we're doing the best we can, just like every parent out there. And uh, I think having the the trying to get the balance is the key. And Dr. Upshaw, if you want to speak to that even a little bit, maybe how, you know, we've got to take care of ourselves too. I, I want to give you that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the same about routine goes for us adults as well. I mean, people aren't even aware of it most of the time, but there's certain things that you do to kind of keep your mental state in balance. Yeah, certain, even little things like, you know, getting a cup of coffee when you go into the office or going into the office itself even though it's associated with work, could be something that gets your mood up and you're not even aware of it. So what I've been telling people is just to, to really take a little bit more account of how you're feeling and what is triggering you know, anxiety or depression or negative states in your mood versus what's giving you a little lift or a pick-me-up that, that you might not have noticed before and to really focus in on that. So for me, when I was coming home, I would turn the news on because I wanted to stay updated, but then I would sit and watch it for two hours and realize that every time I turned it off, I was super depressed and anxious. So now it's kind of like, I don't do that when I get home anymore. I go take a walk or I go do, even though I'm like, oh, I want to know what's going on. I find a different way to check in on that. So it's kind of, as an adult, just being aware. And it sounds like the reason I thought of that is that's exactly what you're doing. But I just kind of wanted to, to kind of, you know, mention that. That's a good way to think about it right now. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, we, Nikki and I, she doesn't watch TV much anyway. But I was just like you. I was like sitting there glued to the news. And I've actually done the opposite, opposite of that now. And, uh, you know, I'll catch bits and pieces or just what I see on my phone on the Internet. I don't want to be obsessed with it. I know what the situation is, but I'm not going to obsess about it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hey, Alicia, mom of four girls, <laughs> um, let's move to, on to you. I, and I know your girls range in age from 13 to four. Um, tell me out of your four daughters, which one, just to kind of get us started here, maybe which one you're worried about the most, uh, tell us her age again and why. Completely glitched out. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. We got you now. Go on. Thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> the computer completely glitched, so I didn't catch anything you said. Okay, let me start over. Um, I just want you, Alicia, you're the mom of four girls, um, ages 13 to four. I want you to tell us, out of your four daughters, which one you're the most concerned about and why. So the, my daughter, um, Savannah, she's 10. She's really the one I'm most concerned about. Um, she's experiencing anxiety, um, not only with the virus, but also with schooling. The virtual schooling has created anxiety in her. Um, she typically does well in school, but just with balancing, having to learn a platform that she's not used to, um, interacting differently with her peers and her teacher has just created this overwhelming sense of, I don't want to say doom, but she struggled for the first few weeks. Um, to the point where she almost shut down and she just didn't want to do schooling at all. We pushed through it and her teachers were amazing. They helped her through it. They sort of cut back on her schoolwork and we're just now starting to see the benefits of that. But now I'm concerned summer's coming and what's going to happen in the fall and how do I prepare her for that going into middle school next year. Yeah, so that, that's a very common experience. And I actually have a 10 year old also. She had a very similar experience. It's funny that you say that my two, my two boys are a little older. They, they did fine with it, but she struggled as well. And that's really the big question you're asking is wh what is school going to look like? And these fifth graders, uh, what, what's going to happen 
when they transition to sixth grade, which is a very big transition from elementary school where everything is a, a little bit more cuddly and you get a lot of support, the classes are smaller, to this middle school environment. And you know, we, we just don't know the answer to that at, at all uh, in terms of are they gonna have smaller class sizes? Are they gonna do some days on, some days off? Are we gonna have to start with e-learning um, over, the, over the internet first? And that, I'm sure, is causing a lot of anxiety for a lot of fifth graders. I know that my daughter is, is quite preoccupied with it as well. I'm glad that, I'm glad that your um, daughter kind of pushed through it and was able to kind of reconnect. I've actually seen a few patients that did shut down, um, and they just basically had to stop doing school for a little while. And, you know, we're going to have to write a letter to the school and kind of work with the school to, to see what to do about it. But that that was a possibility that they would just have to stop. It was just too much. Um, so I'm glad that she was able to push through it. I have to credit her teachers for most of that. Um, her teachers really understood that there was just so much going on. They just allowed her to back off a little bit. They didn't allow her to stop completely, um, but really I have to credit them for helping me get her through that. But like you said, we don't know what next year's coming and I'm not sure how to help prepare her for the unknown, um, but we're trying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's where we're, where we're all at. That's why we're talking today is just right. knowing what, what, what do we do um, until we figure this out. And so, you know, I talked to my kids just trying to take it one day at a time. This is the possible ways it could look, but whatever comes our way, we'll figure it out and we'll, you know, make do with it. You know, Dr. Upshaw, just listening to some of the things that everybody's saying, um, I found what you said earlier in the conversation really helpful. Have dialogue, but not too much dialogue. Like, don't make a problem before there's a problem. And I think that that's super helpful in just dealing with kids of different ages and that it's information overload for all of us. So I really like what you said there about having conversations, but don't go overboard. Try and stick to their concerns and address that directly. Yeah, we don't want our anxieties to spill over into the kids. And that could definitely happen if you start doing a deep dive on all of this. And that's a really important point, especially for younger kids. They're gonna really pick up more on your vibe about how you're handling things and how anxious you are than necessarily about what you say. So if you feel pretty good about things, you're calm about it, you're kind of going about your business, they're gonna pick up on that. If you're super worried and you're anxious and, and, and they're gonna pick up on that a little bit more. Um, so that's also important is to, you know, especially if you or a spouse is worried and you're having conversations, make sure you have those, you know, away from the kids um, so that they don't necessarily pick up your, you know, your anxiety. It's important to be upfront with them and you know be real but at the same time if you're having a moment it's probably best to have that you know away from the kids hey alicia i'm curious out of your four girls being that you have a variety of ages are any of them unfazed and just totally resilient to any of this i'm curious if you've seen that at all um my eight-year-old emma she while she does miss school and her friends and gymnastics, she's pretty even keeled through most of it. Um, I was actually surprised that she would deal with it as well as she has, but we just do a lot more activities, you know, in the backyard now, and she's going through schooling with no problem. Um, and I'm actually really impressed with the way she's handling it. You know, I want to mention here that there's a flip side to this coin, which is that there are some kids, especially in that middle range, high schoolers yet not too young, that are actually doing really, really well during this time because, you know, there's a tendency to kind of uh, over schedule kids. There's a lot of pressure at school sometimes. And, you know, parents are busy and distracted too. And, you know, byproduct of this, parents have been around a lot more with their kids. And the kids, there's not a lot of pressure on them, you know, academically as much. And so I know that my two, my two boys who are 13, you know, they're doing, they're doing fine. They, they just are unconcerned about this. They're just getting online with their friends. They're doing their school thing. And there's just this, the, the stress of like, okay, we got to get to school. Then you got this activity after school and then we're doing this and then we're doing that. 
that's kind of gone. Now, obviously, if this goes on too long and they're not able to connect appropriately, there's going to be consequences of that. But I did want to at least share the flip side that if your kid is doing great, that, that's also happening some. I'm so glad you did. That's an awesome perspective to point out. Um, honestly, guys, you guys have really offered some really good questions and dialogue. Um, Rob or Shelly, Alicia, I'll, I'll open it up. If any of you with Dr. Upshaw here um, can think of any other questions or any um, concerns you might have, um, jump in before we wrap up. Um, like, how concerned should we be that about the lack of social interaction in person that they're getting? I mean, I know there's been a huge over the years. I mean, that they obviously are very comfortable online. They're back in their rooms doing schoolwork right now. Um, but you know, a few months from now, will, will there be some? Well, like social awkwardness or anything I should be doing to prevent that? So that's a great question. Um, in the short term, absolutely not. Kids are super adaptive. You know, they'll pick up where they left off. If, if this goes on for another three to six months or something like that, and we're starting school virtually again, you know, it might start to have a little bit of effect. But again, you would expect that to pick back up, like Robert was saying with, with L you know, she's, she's not getting that interaction. She's regressed a little bit. We wouldn't be too concerned that there'd be some kind of permanent damage um, to, to any kid with a, with a short-term thing. Um, obviously, if they were away for like a year or a year and a half, then you would expect some of that maybe to atrophy to the point where it would be difficult to restart the development. But I wouldn't be concerned. Um, just as long as school starts sometime in the fall, I think everyone should be, should be fine. Um, let me make, make a point here that it sounds like everything is pretty, you know, run of the mill with what you guys are dealing with. If anyone watching this, if you get concerned that there's something that's happening on a daily basis and, you know, something that is not going right, anxiety, not sleeping, depression, suicidal thoughts, you should definitely reach out to a professional. Don't question it. Go ahead and get a consultation because some of that stuff you want to catch earlier instead of later. So if you have concerns, don't hesitate to reach out to a professional. One quick thing, you could go to psychologytoday.com, put in your zip code, and it'll show every therapist and psychiatrist you know, around your area. You can do filters with insurance and all kinds of things like that. So psychologytoday.com. That's great. Um, like I said, guys, I feel like we've really hit a couple of really common themes, and I think that you guys raised some really good questions. Um, like I said, if there's anything else that anybody wants to ask or Dr. Upshaw, maybe just to wrap it up, that, that's great advice with the, the website and I will put that as a link on our website. Um, but just anything that you've seen or any other common themes that maybe we did not address that you've seen in some of your um, patients. I, I think the biggest theme that I've seen from all of this is that everything is changing on a weekly basis. So just, as soon as you've got it figured out, understand that everything's going to be different two weeks from now. And, you know, the way that people handle stuff, both from a mental health standpoint and just the uh, sociological standpoint, is usually pretty predictive and happens in patterns. What we're dealing with now is so atypical that the usual way that we expect people to react, either from a you know, mental illness standpoint or just general health standpoint, is just all up in the air. And that's what I'm seeing in my practice. Every single week has got its own theme. Everything's different. And so just, I guess, be prepared to be on a little bit of a roller coaster here um, until we get to that. Like I said, we're going to deal with this two phases. We're going to be dealing with the virus for a while, but hopefully this kind of uh, sociological kind of phase is going to wrap up soon to where we have a plan and we kind of see the end of how this is going to go. But until we get there, it's going to be a little bit of a roller coaster.